the people of our church are really hungry for worship. Like that's very evident on our Sundays. Like they, it's not long enough. And we do a lot. Like, I mean, we have an hour and a half service and 30 minutes of our worship is at the end of the sermon. So it's in response to this, to, you know, to everything. And so when you start seeing like people like wanting more, asking for more, like going, what are like, where else can I be a part of things? Like, how can I worship more? Um, that hearing that as a pastor, my heart was like, okay, these people are hungry for more, but maybe they don't know like how to pursue that, how to get that. Um, and you know, like YouTube for them isn't like enough, like listening to Mad City or to, you know, Seacoast or whoever, like they're obviously asking for more of in the room with the people type of thing. So we started doing worship nights like once a quarter and uh, early on in the church's history, we put like a ton of production effort into it. So we would, Sam would do like all the lighting cues and we had, I think we would probably do like 14 or 15 cues per song for lights. We do like all different graphics and all that. And more and more, we started asking people in our church, like, what do you, like, what do you love about the worship nights? And they were like, man, I just love it when like, we go off and we start singing something we've never sung before. And we like this, that. And then, so we, so we started realizing all the effort we were putting into the production was actually not what they were wanting. They didn't want like an amped up Sunday, like a beefier Sunday. What they actually just wanted was an, a more relaxed uh, worship experience. So it was four months ago, we went, hey, this summer, let's try and do really low key worship nights on middle of the week, one hour, minimal prep, songs our church has been, have been singing for, you know, for like no new songs, just for them. And the first one, the response from people was like, they were just like, this is what we wanted. If you've been following the channel for the past few years, you have definitely seen our Lighthouse Church videos. I've been friends with Josh since my days in seminary. We were both in the same class together. And I remember when he first planted Lighthouse Church, it was him and maybe a, a dozen or so people meeting in his house. And now it's him and hundreds of people, uh, probably almost a thousand are actually part of their community at this point. And they're meeting at two campuses here in Denver, Colorado. They have the main campus, which you are about to see. They also have a campus in Lakewood, Colorado. And a few weeks ago, Josh told me, Jake, I'm gonna be hosting a worship night and I don't think you have any content on your channel about how to host a worship night. Let's make some content. And can you be uh, a camera operator for our worship night? And I'm like, sure, it's a pretty fair trade. Myself and Chipper ended up going, we brought our cameras along and then we just asked Sam and Josh a ton of questions about the strategy and tech and the philosophy behind their worship nights. And we had a blast. And even though I was running camera, it was a very refreshing experience attending this worship night. And I know many of you in your local church bodies could benefit from these types of events. Maybe you don't have to do it every month. Maybe you could do it once a year or twice a year, or once a quarter, um, but it can be a really great way for people to be able to come to church, to just worship, to pray, and just have that same refreshing experience that we got when we were at Lighthouse Church. So without further ado, let's hand it over to Sam, their worship pastor, who's gonna unpack for us how they prepare for this event. We started about three months ago. So in May. Yeah, so uh, they love it. It's a, it's a consistency of refreshment for them. Um, so it's something they can bank off when they know their, their month's been crazy, their week's been crazy. Um, and then it's something also collaboratively, uh, collaboratively our home groups do together. So uh, whatever week that home group is meeting, if it's on that third week, they all come to Wednesday worship together. So it's a real, really big sense of community. Yeah, so we started our very first one with seven songs and we ran out of time. So we realized about six, because we, we, we like to leave room for spontaneous, see what the Lord does. Um, and if, if we want to sing a couple more bridges or whatever. Um, but so we, so we went to six um, and that really, that really met the hour timeline. 
um, of how we worshiped. And then from there, we've done response. So here at Lighthouse, we take communion every Sunday. Uh, we wanted to add that element. Um, and people loved it, but we really felt like this was just a night to worship. They, they come and take communion on Sundays as well. They're free to do it during the Wednesday worship. But we don't necessarily emphasize that on a Wednesday. It's just an hour of free worship and going for it. So yeah, from top to bottom, there might be a well, there's a welcome. And then from there, there might be a response in the middle from one of the worship leaders, just encouraging people to keep going. But other than that, yeah, it's, it's almost uninterrupted an hour. Yeah, so normally we would capture with four cameras, our sermon camera, two side cameras, and our drum camera. Um, and those are all like posts. So we're all recording onto HDs, uh, hard drives. Um, some of them are SD cards. Some of them are hard drive uh, compatible for like a Ninja. Um, and then from there, I would take it and just record an hour long and uh, they're on the Ninja so they can, a, we're using A7, so on the 30 minute break, they break. But So we're using Atmos Ninjas and they record the whole hour. I take all those hard drives into a um, Adobe Premiere and I multi-cut them. So we really don't, try, we try to make, live stream means more volunteers, more people, more switching. And we want this night to be refreshing for our people. Um, so. By doing that, they're all stationary cameras, but we add shake and post and all that stuff. But um, really, it frees everyone up, and then it's just my job to edit it, and we provide something to those who weren't there. Um, and if it's live or not, we don't really care. But um, yeah, it's really really modest, not, not a huge bang. But for tonight, it's a little different because we want to capture some live songs uh, for, for a new project. Last year, we recorded a 10-song project. This time, uh, people really don't eat music like that anymore. They don't listen to songs in 10-song 10, 10 chunks. Um, and our church is continually writing new music. Uh, so we're going to capture three of those new songs tonight. Um, and we want to add energy so there'll be a couple people running around with cameras. Um, and that way, that adds that energy. And then we'll release them as singles and stuff like that. Yeah, so um, everything's going from input uh, to a snake. Um, and then we're running that to a Midas 32 back of house. Um, and then from there, everything gets sent via AES over to the front of house wing. Uh, the only thing separate from that is we have a second S or S32. So, uh, just a, just a stage box, um, that's running the drums out individually to front of house. So we only send stereo drums to back of house and then we send individual drums to front of house. Yep, so every in input goes through and... Yep, and it's independent ears. Yeah. Um, so we, we are able to compress an EQ just for the in-ears um, and leave that independent uh, and only gain set for front of house. And then front of house has, has its own independent EQ and compression and effects. Yeah, so first, uh, first is the redundancy. Um, so we've got a USB coming out of the M32 into a Mac Mini um, and it is hitting Reaper. So it's 32 tracking Reaper um, and then that's our redundancy. And then for uh, first, what we really want uh, is the Wa Waves Live 32 uh, card because um, we're going to get individual drums out of that. We're going to get stereo tracks that are that are true. Um, oh. Sorry, I said Waves, Wing Live. Wing sorry, oh, my apologies. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're we're running the Wing Live 32 SD uh, SD card. Yep. A Daisy and I will sit down and write a song, and uh, if we feel like, man, that's a winner, uh, we'll pre-pro it, demo it, uh, we'll make a rough demo. Um, and one of the high values that we have is before we're actually gonna release a song of like, hey, let's put this on Spotify, we really love this song, we need to play it live. Um, people tell you a lot about your, your own songs uh, when you play them live. Uh, we've, we've reworked arrangements because we played them live and gone, hey, we need this, we need this. Uh, it's not long enough, it's not short enough. Um, and so so we'll demo it, play that demo probably three times, and then we'll kind of decide, yeah, that's a winner. Um, and then from there, we'll live capture, and then we'll take it back, and we'll use some of the demo stuff, but we, I really have a high value of taking as much live as I can. So everything gets bounced out of Logic and goes into an Ableton uh, file, um, and then we make individual master sessions for the Sunday. Um, so we'll mix in our own songs and an Ableton with whatever cover songs we're playing that night, tonight. Um, and then, yeah, we run an Ableton. We're not running any light cues or anything like that. It's just strictly tracks and cues um, and click. Uh, and then from there, uh, yeah, we, we run through. We use a loop to miss um, to trigger all the, uh, all the uh, songs. Uh, usually our MD, but tonight we're splitting it between an MD and uh, the bass player will fire the loop to miss. 
So tonight we'll capture, I will take that, what hopefully is the uh, Wing Live 32 SD card, um, and I will load that into the computer. Um, and the way they capture that is in segments, um, and we'll drop all the waves into their own file. Um, and so from there, we'll kind of assess what needs to be pulled from the demo. So if there's something that uh, we're going, hey, that, that guitar part didn't land, um, we already have that in the demo, um, or if a vocal's fried, um, we might overdub that, but it's also in the demo. Um, and then from there, we'll create our own song files of mixed versions now. So um, from there, we'll start cutting it up and quantizing drums and mixing in the box completely. Um, and then from there, getting uh, a full mix down of it. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take it piece like we're gonna take a whole like a chunk of content and then just give ourselves time. So tonight we'll record three songs, but I'll probably take three weeks to almost a whole month uh, just to work on one song. Because um, last time we did ten songs within three months of me mixing. Um, excuse me, um, we mix produced demoed and mixed all, within six months that took three months to to mix all 10 songs and it was a whole lot on top of pastoring <laughs> and leading other people um and and leading volunteers um so now we'll start with our first one it's called faith and power and we'll i'll mix it we'll, we'll get everything dialed in and then from there um i'd say that probably take me two weeks and then probably from there any revisions we usually give a week about revisions between josh and i and a daisy and i um and then from there we'll go to mastering right now we just use aria mastering um and that's just an online uh analog mastering um and then from there we'll go on spotify yeah aria so it's an online program and you load up your master file you need to leave about just like any ma anytime you want to send off a master uh, you got to leave about negative three db of headroom and then from there they have um they run it through an analog board but they literally have a robot arm that that previews your music and then it uses analog gear as a robot arm to assess your mids lows and highs and then master it yeah yeah so use? once the, once the song's done um, from there, we'll, we'll, we'll have a preloaded uh, premiere with just already the footage lined up because um, that's why we just we never cut because everything's all ready to go. And then from there, we'll multi-cut when we're ready. We'll just take that section and create a new sequence and go, okay, this song, let's multi-cut it. Um, and then from there, once that song is done, we'll put, that, we'll put the audio on it and cut it and then post it. Yeah, whenever you're taking a capture, make sure your import, input source is good. Um, so gain setting, whether that's at your front of house or back of house. Because um, whatever you're capturing from, if you have something clipped, by the time you get it to the studio, there's no fixing that. So um, that's gone. <laughs> uh, so that's a waste for you if you don't take that time to set that. Um, second, yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say crowd mining is super essential. You're trying to capture the element uh, that's live. Um, and you also have to remind your sound guys not to pump the system. Uh, it's a fun night, but at the end of the day, once you start crossing the threshold for our room about about 92 dB, dB you start to get the room and the PA um, more than you get the crowd singing. So as much as you want to have fun and really pump the music, you want to make sure you still ca capture that element of the crowd. Um, make sure your band's rehearsed. <laughs> um, if you're going to capture a song, make sure everybody knows why they're doing it, what they're doing it for, um, and then making sure they're nailed down and prepped. Um, and then make sure you have ample rehearsal time. Uh, tonight we won't have a ton of rehearsal time because most of our, our band is a staff band or um, they, they play a ton with us, so there's a lot of history there. Yeah, I would say give yourself ample time. Um, it's nothing's fun when you're just like, hey, want to do this? And then, you, oh, okay, in three days we'll do a live recording or we'll capture something. It's like, no, there's systems to things that you're going to run into troubleshooting. Um, you're going to run into issues and you're going to have to figure those out. And then also, I would also say make sure just as much as you want to capture live, also make sure your front of house is just as phenomenal as what you want to capture in the studio um, because you have people experiencing that and they want to have a great worship experience with you. Um, and a great sound leads to great response and great, uh, a great time for people to respond to Jesus. I love the wing. Uh, to all the haters, whatever. Yeah, if anybody really hates it, I, I just don't think they spent the time to look into it. Uh, there's so much user function. Um, basically, to me, it's like a DAW in your hands. 
Um, there's a lot of stuff. So for us, we went from an M32 with a Waves rack and a sound grid server, and I can do everything I did on a Waves rack in this wing. Um, so yeah. <laughs> So we're using Likey. Um, we use it in probably the most simplest form that it can be used. Um, you're, you're taking one cue and putting all your light settings in it. Um, we've done worship nights where you, we fire off multiple cues that have multiple settings on them. Um, we've had flashing lights on the two and four of a snare. Um, but really for this, the whole idea is to keep it low key. Um, and this is how we do it on a Sunday. It's volunteer friendly. Um, they don't ever touch Likey. So Likey is completely independent off uh, MIDI, MIDI signals firing from Proclaim to Likey. Um, and then and then from there, yeah, all settings are in one queue. Um, we're sending uh, Proclaim to the main, uh, to all the screens via just this computer. Um, and then what we're actually doing is there's two projectors basically just flipped on their side, sending to another projector screen. And what we're doing is we're sending an NDI of the side screens. So like we're taking a, a, a picture and basically creating a, a triple wide of it. And then we're sending two images to the back computer via NDI. And then we're flipping them in a program called Malumen, um, which is like a production, uh, big production program. But w basically what we're able to do is take those two images, flip them however needed, because the projectors are different, different angles, um, and then shoot them on the main screen so that they're straight with the main image. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not huge on cameras. I don't know a ton about them. Um, but uh, our production engineer before me uh, loved Sony A7Threes. You know him, Andrew. Um, he was on a video. Um, he loved Sonys. Uh, I have no qualms with them. They're pretty user-friendly to me. Um, but yeah, so we got the Sony A7 here on the right side, close up. Um, and then we put one in the back of the room on the left side. And what we're able to do that is, uh, what we're able to do with that is when we're shooting in 4K, um, we can actually create 1080 different shots. So you got the original 4K wide, but you can zoom in on each singer and get a, four, uh, a 1080 shot on that each singer. Um, and then you're just adding angles basically. Um, and we'll actually do the same thing here as we'll 4K, kind of whitish, but get in uh, a close up on each singer on the right side and the left side. Um, and then lastly, we have the sermon camera, which is dead center near front of house. Um, and that's just capturing more of a wide, uh, straight, straight view. On a Thursday when we record a sermon, we actually zoom the lens in and we actually capture really what, all that we need um, and zoom it in and get, you know, basically that front eight feet section of where Josh is preaching. Um, that way we don't lose a ton of quality cropping in. Um, but on, uh, on any other capture, we're actually capturing, geez, two feet outside of each projector screen on the side you see here. So we're capturing the whole room um, and then zooming in on everything. 4,600, yeah, that's, uh, that's the white balance for us in this room. Um, and then we just, I've set the ISOs. It's a bright room, and especially shooting at the bright stage, um, we're about 250 ISO. Um, and then from there, we just post edit from anything else, but we're not using any, any LUTs or anything on the Atmos because we have the Atmos V5, and you can, you can add LUTs and stuff, but we're not using that. So you got um, a Pearl drum kit. Um, it's real shells, real drum kit. It's Josh's old drum, metal drum kit. Um, but what we did is um, we're not a huge fan of tuning and miking a bunch of drums. Um, most volunteers don't even know how to EQ or compress a real drum. So uh, what we did is we put Remo silent strokes on them. Um, so they kill 80% decibel. Um, so we put one on the kick, snare, both toms. Um, and then what we did is put Yamaha triggers on them. Uh, so we used to have just a regular, just MIDI uh, brain that would go into Logic on a computer um, and run a drum software, but now we really love the Alessi Ale Strike Pro. Um, and why we love that is because it has capabilities of taking your samples, adding triggered velocities, um, and really it has a capability to sound really real. Um, so we use upper room uh, kick and snare, and then we found a couple Tom uh, samples, loaded them on an SD card, uh, and then we set our own triggers and re-triggers. Um, that takes a little bit of time of just dialing in. You'll get some double hits and stuff like that. But um, other than that, um, all that runs into a stereo out for back of house out of the Alessi. So you have uh, stereo outs and then you have individual outs of each drum on that module. Um, so we're sending those individual outs through our stage box to front of house alone. Um, and then 
Um, other than that, uh, got some Zildjian symbols. They're really just old symbols that Josh stuck in the dirt and had fun with, <laughs> um, but they sound great. 22-inch uh, ride, 18-inch dry crash. Uh, we use 16-inch crashes for the hi-hats. Um, and then uh, we've got a china to add some fun for some breakdowns if we feel it. Um, overheads, uh, we put we basically when we put this plywood um, on there, we sh we uh, assembled a pole right in the middle of that plywood and just screwed it in. Um, so we put mic clips on that pole and then we put uh, newer NW800s. They're twenty dollar Amazon microphones, um, and to us they sound incredible. Um, so we sure do have to EQ the crap out of them, but um, they do they do the wash thing. Um, really matters about your symbols, honestly. Um, then from there, plexiglass, yeah, uh, local company. We bought the sheets um, we needed uh, at the right size. And then literally we went to Home Depot and bought door connectors. Uh, we pre-drilled all the holes and put it together and sitting on an old drum riser that we built. Um, not a ton of space, but, uh, and then also in there is our Ableton rig. Big thanks to Josh and Sam for taking the time to walk us through how they plan and prepare and execute a worship night for their church. And I can't wait to hear how this video benefits you and uh, the way you go about planning a worship event for your church. I'm gonna leave links to Lighthouse Church below this video so you can subscribe to their YouTube channel and you can check out some of the recordings that they've been producing from these worship nights. If you found the video helpful, please leave a like, share it with your friends and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our latest content to help you grow yourself and grow your worship ministry.